afternoon. My name is Steve Durian with Jefferson County, and I'm the chair of the Dr. Cog Transportation Advisory Committee, and I call to order the September 19th, 2022 Dr. Cog Tech Meeting. This hybrid meeting, members of the public attending by Zoom have the ability to mute and unmute themselves and share their webcam. We ask that those intending to speak use the raise hand button to ask a question or comment on the agenda item. Please make sure that your name is typed and reflects your first and last name and your representation. Uh, one other thing, uh, for members who are here remotely, uh, we are only going to have a uh, comment and discussion here in the room, so I uh, apologize for that, but uh, let's uh, try to just bring, bring this meeting a little bit more in person. Um, for members of the public, I suppose we have public comment that can be done uh, remotely. That, um, uh, we'll do roll call. Or, yes, roll call. Uh, so we'll go around the room and uh, please introduce yourselves. Uh, we'll start uh, down this end. Justin, you want to start us up? Mormon, City of Thornton. And I think we have a couple of new members. Uh, Jacob, do you want to introduce those folks? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, new alternate for Douglas County, Jim Kotzer um, is new alternate, so welcome to Jim. And then in Boulder County, we have a temporary alternate from the city of Boulder, Garrett Slater. So welcome to them both. Yep. Okay, next we have um, a public comment. Is there anyone here in the room or coming in remotely that would like to uh, make any comments on behalf of the public. Please raise your hand, by the way, if you're... Okay, well, we'll pu close public comment. Oh, go ahead, Rob. Chair, thank you. I just did want to um, direct the members and alternates of TAC to the email that Cam Kennedy sent out earlier today. We did receive uh, three comments uh, from members of the public on the RTP amendment directed to the TAC. So we've got those out to you this morning. Sorry for late notice. We just wanted to wait and see how many we might get in. So I'm all in support of the. We'll close public comment and we'll move on to um, the August 22nd to 2022 TAC meeting summary. Is there anyone? who has any uh, changes or suggested changes to the uh, meeting summary. Seeing any hands? All those uh, approved then. Our first, uh, let's see, our first action item today is uh, item four on your agenda, which is 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan 2022 air quality conformity, and state greenhouse gas planning standard compliance. Jacob, you've got this one. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Jacob Rieger, Dr. Cog staff, along with my colleague Alvin Bedal sanchez um, It has been a long nine months, but we really appreciate you sticking with us through this. Um, this should be the final presentation on our 2050 Regional Transportation Plan update. Um, so um, in terms of the work that we have done and what we're asking you to make a recommendation on today, uh, what we're calling our action documents for, um, for your consideration is the updated 2050 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan itself. Um, and its appendices, of which there are now 20, I believe, Appendix A through Appendix T. Uh, but in particular, we're calling out a couple of those appendices. One is the air quality conformity determination documents, 
Uh, we update those every time that we make a change to uh, a major change to the plan. Um, that's Appendix S. And then new appendix based on the state greenhouse gas planning standard uh, required by the rule is something called the Greenhouse Gas Transportation Report, um, which we've discussed. Um, that has become Appendix T. It itself has uh, some, some sub-appendices within it, um, but that collection of documentation required by the rule um, is Appendix T um, as part of the plan. So these are really kind of the three big um, action documents that we are bringing to you for your consideration today. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Alvin to get us started. Everyone, uh, as introduced, Alvin Bizot Sanchez, Senior Transportation Planner, uh, pronouns are he, him, his, and I'll go through a couple slides before I pass it back over to Jacob. Um, but like he mentioned, we've been working on this for about nine months. You could even say 10 if you looked at our staff kickoff where we were soliciting uh, project-based amendments to the 2050 RTP. So that started in December of 2021. Uh, throughout the following months, we worked to uh, process those requested amendments, work with project sponsors, what was appropriate at this point to process into the, the update. Um, we looked at how we were going to represent programmatic investments in the plan, in the model from our plan. So we do have a lot of money from our RTP that we call programmatic. So what isn't project specific, but we know is going to impact mobility in the region. But we also looked at defining a baseline. Jacob will go into that more on a couple of his slides because that's a key piece of the greenhouse gas planning standard. Um, we did work around some initial reduction estimates that showed us that we were going to have to do even more work to actually meet these emission reduction levels. And so a number of different strategies came into play over the next couple months, uh, including mitigation measures, which was a final, uh, final uh, push to meet that, meet that gap in the emission reduction levels. Um, we drafted a new appendix, the Greenhouse Gas Transportation Report, and all those different sub-appendices, updated a number of different appendices, including the Appendix S, air quality conformity determination, as well as uh, the some little small minor updates to the coordinated transit plan, um, the public engagement plan, just to point people in the correct place for the different aspects we were updating for the plan. August was our major public review period, so that lasted about 31 days. That included public meetings, stakeholder meetings. We also uh, provided the documents for review to uh, the Transportation Commission, CDPHE, and then we're now here today, September, um, starting our adoption process. Uh, we also presented to the TC earlier this month. So the Greenhouse Gas Planning Standard, uh, as you all know, was adopted December last year. It applies to CDOT and the five MPOs in the state of which Dr. Cog is one. Our RTP has to meet the rules emission reduction levels for four analysis years, 2025, 2030, 2040, and 2050. And that updated plan has to be adopted by October 1st of this year. And like I mentioned, the reduction levels are from a baseline. So uh, the baseline as defined by the rule is the adopted plan as modeled. Like I mentioned, the rule applies to the five MPOs and CDOT. So there are emission reduction levels for four different analysis years, 2025, 2030, 2040, and 2050. Uh, the values on your screen are shown in million metric tons. As we were doing this work, engaging with the public, we realized that wasn't a very intuitive way to understand what that might mean. So uh, for 2025, what does 0.27 million metric tons look like? That's a little over 58,000 gas-powered cars being converted to electric. So we've done that for each of these uh, 2030. The emission reduction level is roughly equivalent to a little under 176,000 gas-powered cars being converted to electric. 2040s, 0.63 million metric tons is roughly equivalent to a little over 135,000 gas-powered cars. And 2050s is just under 80,000 gas-powered cars being converted to electric. I mentioned as we got into this work, we realized it was going to take a number of different strategies to meet these emission reduction levels. Uh, the first two on this layered screen are related to those programmatic investments. So the small scale projects that we don't list in the plan, you don't see in a map, but we know are going to be completed. So transit service, sidewalks, um, bicycle lanes, that includes both what was adopted in the plan last year and what we've been able to add to the plan through our work with project sponsors. There's also major project changes. So again, working with CDOT, local project sponsors, what were the changes we could make to the scopes of different projects in the plan to help meet these emission reduction levels. We were also able to use um, near-term land use adjustments, so recognizing that the region's been growing a little differently, and we've been able to see that through observed data. Uh, we've been able to be consistent with some of the state's assumptions around telework, so that was taken into account. And then the last piece to meet those emission reduction levels was mitigation measures as defined by the state. So um, I'll pass it back over to Jacob to go into a little more detail on each of those different layers and strategy pieces. Thanks, Alvin. So admittedly, 
Um, the rule is complex. Our process to comply with the rule has been complex. So this is a slide you've seen before, but not for a little bit. We wanted to really just kind of lay out, hopefully in relatively plain English, the sort of process and flow um, that we use to comply with the rule. Uh, we started with the baseline, of course, and as Alvin alluded to, that is defined in the rule. The baseline is our 2050 regional transportation plan as it was originally adopted in April of 2021, and really as it was modeled at the time of adoption. So any anything that we've done, anything that was in the plan that was modeled at the time becomes part of the baseline. Everything that we've done since then has really been to build on that baseline in service of meeting the reduction levels of the rule. Um, one of the first things that we did, as you'll remember back in the uh, winter and spring we talked about this, is representing what we called programmatic or non-project specific investments um, in our modeling. That's something that we had not traditionally done, but it's a really important part of the plan. Um, I call it the connective tissue of our transportation system. Um, you know, sidewalks, bike paths, intersection operations, all the things that really make our transportation system work. Uh, but in a 30-year long-range plan, we don't identify them as individual projects. We hadn't in the past modeled them. So we really wanted to get our arms around reflecting what's a significant part of our plan and a significant part of our financial plan um, in terms of this modeling uh, greenhouse gas work. Um, so that was step two. Um, step three was looking at the major multimodal project investment mix in the plan from the perspective of the GHG rule uh, and making some targeted sort of surgical adjustments to some of the projects um, in the plan and the spirit of the rule. Uh, we worked with many of you as sort of project sponsors um, and stakeholders to do that. Um, so that was a big important step that we worked on together in step three. Um, also part of step three, based on some changes to the projects and, and corresponding changes in the financial plan of the 2050 RTP, we also reallocated $900 million in the overall cost feasible or fiscally constrained financial plan to additional programmatic investments because they are helpful um, in terms of supporting this work and helping us comply with the reduction levels. So that was all in step three. And then step four, kind of that final step was the mitigation action plan. We spent a long time talking about this, but as a reminder, that's uh, provided for in the rule, um, kind of that last step to close the remaining gap um, to meet the reduction levels. So we work together on defining uh, some potential mitigation measures and express those in what's required by the rule as a mitigation action plan. There we go. So just a quick reminder of this on the programmatic side. Um, again, you've seen this before, it's been a little bit, but we spent a lot of time and a lot of effort uh, really understanding those non-project specific investments in the plan, how we could actually reflect them and include them um, in our travel demand modeling. So I won't go through this in great detail, but the point here is just a lot of thought equity, so to speak, in terms of you know, the, the categories of uh, funding of programmatic investment that we have in the 2050 RTP already, um, and the things that we can do in the model on the right-hand side of the slide um, to actually reflect those investments within the modeling environment and our technical analysis environment for greenhouse gas emissions. Um, in terms of project modifications, we spent some time together on this, but just really briefly, we did a few things here um, together, again, looking at the major project investment mix, those projects that we do identify and map and list in the plan and model in our traffic model. Uh, we looked at those in the spirit of the greenhouse gas rule, um, worked with project sponsors to understand were there some things, again, strategically and surgically we could do to the project mix in the plan um, to help us you know, solve the issues that these very important projects are trying to address, but do it in a way that's a little bit more uh, greenhouse gas friendly. So working primarily with CDOT as well as some local project sponsors, uh, we did make some modifications to the Central 25 project and to the E470 managed lane projects in Jefferson County. Both of those projects are still in the plan, um, but they are expressed in the plan now as sort of bottleneck, safety, operations, multimodal, community connections types, types of projects. Um, so that was the freeway projects. Um, in the Dr. Cog sort of directed funding uh, projects, the Dr. Cog directed funding portion of the plan, uh, we worked with project sponsors primarily in Arapahoe County on some of the projects that are two to six lanes or four to six lanes um, to explore if we could keep those projects at four lanes. But again, refocus the scope just a little bit, you know, multimodal operations, um, safety, intersection improvements, bike paths, whatever the case may be, recognizing, again, those are important projects. They're trying to solve really important issues um, you know, keeping those projects in the plan, but refocusing their scope just a little bit, again, to be a little bit more greenhouse gas friendly. Um, other big thing here is that, as you all know, in the original 2050 RTP, we did identify a very robust bus rapid transit network, um, 10 to 12 corridors across the region to implement over the 30 years of the plan. 
admittedly pretty aggressively through the changes here that we've worked on together, we are proposing that five of those bus rapid transit corridors would be implemented by 2030 through a multi-agency planning and funding partnership. Uh, very assertive for sure, um, but I think really important to the region just, you know, in terms of good planning and in terms of good mobility, but yes, also in terms of helping us meet uh, the reduction levels. And then finally, talked about through these changes and some other changes in the financial plan, um, kind of freeing up and reallocating about $900 million towards additional programmatic investments, which we also analyzed in the greenhouse gas report to help us meet the um, uh, reduction levels in the rule. Uh, we talked a lot about the mitigation action plan, so I probably won't go through these individually, but um, again, as a reminder, sort of that last step that's provided for in the rule, you know, we do all these other things that we've talked about. We still have a little bit of a gap to close. The rule provides that you can do that through identifying mitigation measures and preparing a mitigation action plan. Um, for us, many of the mitigation measures that are were defined as part of the rulemaking and defined as part of CDOT's Policy Directive 1610 were measures that we already incorporated in the plan or we incorporated in our technical analysis. So we, we'd already, you know, had incorporated a lot of those measures in our technical work. Therefore, we focused on more kind of policy-oriented, qualitative, land use, land use transportation types of measures. Um, those are what we focused on in terms of working uh, with all of you and with the region to identify some mitigation measures that seemed reasonable and built on the work that this region is already doing around transit-oriented development, around urban centers, pedestrian focus areas, um, employment, residential density and intensity, parking policy, complete streets. Um, those were really sort of the building blocks of the mitigation measures that we proposed through the mitigation action plan. As we've said many times, and it bears repeating, at the local government level, these are all voluntary. Um, local governments are not required to implement these specific measures in specific locations at specific time. Um, but again, we're trying to build on the planning work that's already being done in this region. Um, we will be reporting on this annually. That's a requirement of the rule. We don't need these mitigation measures in terms of compliance until 2030. So we have eight more years to work together as a region to fine tune this. Um, and we can make adjustments to our mitigation action plan. So just showing again those mitigation measures, um, what we came up with, you recall we did a geographic analysis, knowing that the region is already doing most of these things already, we wanted to understand the additional sort of increment of possibility to continue to do this work, um, where, you know, where that might make sense geographically, a GIS analysis of the potential sort of magnitude of implementation of these and the greenhouse gas emission reductions we think would be associated um, you know, with that implementation of these mitigation measures. So these, um, these emission reduction estimates, these are in metric tons, by the way. Everything else is in million metric tons. These are actual metric tons of what we estimated um, of greenhouse gas emission reductions associated with these measures. So finally, when you put all of that work together, all of the strategies that we've talked about, the project changes, the mitigation action plan, the programmatic investments, everything we've talked about, you end up with a table like this, which is required by the rule that demonstrates the emission reductions associated with our framework of strategies to meet compliance with the rule. You sum that all up, and in the fourth line of this table, the total greenhouse gas reductions, again, we're back to million metric tons here, um, but the fourth, the fourth row, the bold total GHG reductions is the cumulative reductions that we're estimating, emission reductions associated with all of this work. We compare that with the fifth row, the bold red, uh, which are the uh, requirements, the reduction levels that we need to meet that are specified for the Dr. Cog MPO area in the greenhouse gas planning standard. And we make sure that the black bold, so to speak, is greater or higher than the red bold uh, so that we can demonstrate that yes, for each of the analysis years in the Dr. Cog MPO area, we are meeting the emission reduction levels that are required of us. And yes, this is important compliance with the rule and I don't wanna minimize that, but you know, one thing that I do wanna emphasize, this isn't just about checking a box of numbers, this is about good planning. And we've tried to approach this as staff as like, good planning for the region, good integrated multimodal land use transportation planning. Um, all the work that you're doing, all the work that we're doing together that we've done over the years, really that's the framework and the foundation that we're trying to build on um, in this strategy framework to demonstrate compliance with the rule. So that's the technical stuff in terms of, okay, what does all this mean in terms of the plan and how the plan is changing? When we, had, when we originally adopted the plan in April of 2021, over on the left-hand side, we had our main 2050 RTP plan document, four chapters, about 180 pages. We had 19 appendices, I believe, A through S, uh, which includes a lot of federal and state requirements, methodologies, 
um, things that we want to include as part of the plan, bringing together our, our other multimodal planning work that we've done together as a region, all in the ecosystem of the 2050 RTP. For what we're calling this 2022 update over on the right, here's what we did. We made some routine updates to the plan document reflecting this work that we've described today. We made some routine and minor updates to a few appendices. Most of the appendices didn't change, but some of them did. So for example, the air quality conformity documents, the financial plan, uh, the model output measures, you know, those types of appendices did change. We did update those. Um, as I just said, we did update the air quality conformity documents. Regardless of state rules, anytime we make major changes or updates to the 2050 RTP, we are federally required to update our air quality conformity work, so we have done that. And then, as I've said, finally, as required by the rule, a new Appendix T, the new Greenhouse Gas Transportation Report, which really was sort of the hub for everything that Alvin and I have talked about today in terms of the work that we did, the emission reductions associated with that, our modeling methodologies, um, our travel demand model, the EPA moves model, everything that we did, even our engagement, is part of the Greenhouse Gas Transportation Report. So speaking of public engagement, um, again, Alvin highlighted this, just want to go in a little bit more detail. We had our 31-day public comment period through the month of August and early September. We had a social pinpoint site uh, where we put all the documents available. We had an idea wall. People could comment on the idea wall. People could mark up the documents if they wanted to. Uh, we had the video that we did originally as part of the plan to reorient people to the plan. During the 31-day public comment period, we made a series of presentations um, as requested by, by folks who ever wanted a presentation. But the framework of that is that we had five virtual public open house meetings. Um, they were all the same, but we varied them by time of day and day of the week. Um, and two of them, we had simultaneous Spanish interpretation. We had our virtual public hearing in front of a special Dr. Cog board meeting on September 7th. Uh, we tried out for the first time having both simultaneous Spanish and American sign language interpretation. We had not done that before. I um, think that went pretty well. Um, we had a, a lot of promotion during the public comment period, social media, e-blast, getting the word out. Here's just some visual examples of some of the things that we did um, to get the word out, encourage people to check out the Social Pinpoint site. Um, we did get a lot of press coverage, both um, primarily locally and statewide, um, but even a few kind of national publications because this rule, the statewide rule, is kind of cutting edge nationally. So again, here's just some visual snapshots of some of the articles, uh, some press coverage that we got as part of this work. And then here's some statistics in terms of our engagement. Um, transparency, there are a couple of these actually that um, updates that didn't make it into, into these slides. We actually had uh, 45 uh, social media posts and we had 8,700 social media impressions in the middle of the screen here. Oh, actually it is there, okay, good. This just gives you a sense of the engagement. And I'd say overall, uh, we really did have a lot of engagement. We had a lot of comments on our idea wall. Um, in fact, just in terms of actual comments received as part of this process, we had close to 350 altogether between the public comment period and the public hearing. Just by that metric of volume, that was actually more than we had for the original plan uh, last year. Um, in terms of characterizing those comments, I'm always leery of doing that. The comments were very complex. Um, this was the first time that we tried out the idea wall and it was you know, kind of internet-y, interactive to use <laughs> old people's terms. But um, the idea was that people could post on the comment wall and then you could actually react to somebody else's comments. You could comment on someone else's comment. We'd never done that before. You could like and I think dislike other people's comments. So some of that interaction was just actually people commenting with each other. And that was a really neat dynamic to see. But in terms of trying to characterize 350 pretty diverse comments, here's how I would do it. Um, I think a large set of comments was support. Uh, for the proposed updates in this plan to comply with the state greenhouse gas planning standard. Um, there were a set of comments that also supported the updates, but wish, you know, in their characterization that we'd done even more, um, a desire to shift investment even further from roadways and highways to transit and other multimodal travel options. Uh, we did have some comments that took a different view, we were kind of in opposition to that, um, opposition to the greenhouse gas planning standard, opposition to the techniques, that, the strategies that we used, and expressing a preference for additional roadway and highway-oriented investment. Um, we also had a few um, neutral or technical comments, particularly on the markups of the documents. Um, I know at least a couple of you here, Brian Weimer, Sarah Grant, actually reviewed the documents and marked them up, so we appreciate that. And as I said, we had some active dialogue directly between comments and commenters on the idea wall. So as part of your packet, um, we have taken every single comment received, we have responded to it in some way, even if it's just thanking them 
for their comment, but we want to be transparent in terms of showing the comments received and our response to them. So that's part of your packet and that's part of the documentation that we do as part of our planning process to be transparent. So um, last thing here is I also want to be transparent about what changes did we make to the plan based on our public comment period. We did do a few things. Um, there are some staff initiated changes. There's a correction to table one of the greenhouse gas report, which is appendix T. That was really to clarify that we didn't need mitigation measures in the 2025 analysis year. We were mistakenly showing that. So the substance of the table was correct, but we were mistakenly showing mitigation measures as part of the strategy for 2025 when that's not needed. Um, there was a copy editing meeting, sort of a grammatical sort of review of the document, um, correction to page 11 of the greenhouse gas report um, in the additional programmatic investment section. Um, the text there was accurate, the content was accurate, but there was a sentence fragment based on the copy editing, so we clarified the intent of that sentence. And then there was a formula correction to Appendix T, the greenhouse gas report, subappendix C, which is the model outputs. Um, there was just a summation formula error, um, so that was corrected. And then based on the public comment period, um, in Table 3.1 of the plan, we did add some transit references to some of the projects in Arapahoe County as requested by the Arapahoe County project sponsors in terms of the characterization of the revised scope of those projects in Arapahoe County based on those project changes that I discussed earlier. So with that, this is the motion that we are asking for. Um, before we get there, though, I do want to say three things. First is I want to thank all of you um, as stakeholders. This has been a lot of work together. We really appreciate the partnership. We know it's been a lot of meetings, a lot of updates, a lot of coordination. We very much appreciate the partnership to work through this process for the very first time. I also want to thank Dr. Cox's staff. There were a lot of people a lot smarter than me who really contributed to this work. I think about 20 people all together in three different divisions um, of Dr. Cog were part of this team. And I want to publicly thank that staff for working together um, to get this done. And then finally, before we go to the motion, I do want to give CDOT an opportunity and I want to, I want to make this point. You know, we collaborated closely with a lot of project sponsors through this work, particularly with CDOT because the rule also applies to CDOT. CDOT also updated their 10-year plan. And we worked very closely together to have that coordinated strategy and reflecting in both of our planning documents the work that we jointly did together. So I do want to give CDOT a chance to um, talk about briefly their changes to the 10-year plan. So I think I'm going to turn that over to Jessica to start. Thank you, Jacob. And if I had to give you a social media impression on all the work on the RTB, it would be a, a big thumbs up and a smiley face. So. We're really thankful for our partnership with Dr. Cog, and we've also been spending a lot of time updating our 10-year plan, so we know the level of effort that it takes to update these planning documents and really kind of step through the strategic process of which projects are moving forward, how, much, how many dollars do we allocate to each of those projects. Many of you sat with us during our 4P processes, so some of these things should definitely not be a surprise, and we thank you for taking the time to sit through those. We held eight of them over about seven months of time, so a lot of input from our local agency partners as well as our Transportation Commission. And just last week, our Transportation Commission did approve our 10-year plan. So what you're seeing here today and then the second page that has kind of all the notes, that draft will go away that is now in final form. So a few notable project changes. Um, oh, sorry. Yep, so that draft will go away. And then back to the prior slide. Thanks. So the um, couple notable changes, Jacob already mentioned a commitment to region-wide arterial uh, transit and BRT improvements. Is This was really one of the biggest steps that's going to get us toward meeting our greenhouse gas um, requirements. And so in our plan, we directed an additional $100 million toward BRT. Uh, Jacob mentioned a few of the corridors, but that's really exciting for the region and for really moving mobility and providing additional ways for the public to travel. Um, I-270 remained as a major commitment, the expansion of I-270 as well as the bridge bundle package, uh, which is replacing really outdated and aging infrastructure. Uh, Central I-25, which we define as about 20th, 23rd to Alameda, um, about $100 million from that corridor was shifted um, into BRT and other places. There are some dollars remaining as that's a critical um, part of our of our interstate, and those will be focused on non-capacity, operational, and safety improvements. Um, I-70 Floyd Hill, we just recently were uh, received notice that we won $100 million in mega, so very excited about that. That really um, launches that project forward with um, construction and design. 
Um, the I-25 North Corridor remains in our plan, so that would be, some of you know it as Segment 2, 84th Avenue to 104th Avenue, uh, $20 million in strategic funding over the next four years to really dive deep into design. And last week at Transportation Commission, we did commit to uh, financing options to determine what we need to make that corridor move forward and to ensure that we have the funding available once we determine the multimodal and safety alternative um, that's appropriate. And then Eisenhower Johnson Memorial Tunnel, many of you have driven through there, so we've um, continued our commitment through that. Um, and I'll just take the, a moment to say we've got a really exciting project going on there right now. We're replacing the grout bed and the panels in the tunnel. If you decide to drive through the tunnel at midnight, between the hours of midnight and 5 a.m., we do have alternating lane closures um, over the next four weeks. But lots of work going on, uh, much needed at the Eisenhower Johnson Memorial Tunnel. Those are, those are our key highlights. We had small shifts in other places. If you're really excited about that, you can compare the prior plan to this plan that you see on the screen. And as I mentioned, that draft uh, watermark will be going away as Transportation Commission did finalize it last week. And I'll turn it over to our partners in Region 4. Thank you, Jessica. Appreciate that update. Uh, I apologize that Heather Paddock's not here. She was feeling a little ill today, so she wasn't she wasn't able to make it. So what I did do though is I bring down our senior planner that's been been uh, working with Heather hand in hand as well as our 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 partners with Dr. Cog and our other planning areas. To Region Four does have pl four planning areas, two MPOs and two TPRs. So we have been very busy over the last several months and. Some of the highlights that, that we did now, some of these aren't specifically related to Dr. Cog, but they are uh, notable changes to the plan. And we'll, the three of them there on the top are, are roundabouts that were uh, identified for safety region, reasons. Uh, Wellington, and they're all associated with high schools or, or public areas, US 36 at Community Drive. It's another access point into a, a public park. So uh, having those roundabouts in there is gonna be a benefit for all those communities and those projects. The one that is within Dr. Cog is uh, segment I-25 or I-25 segment five uh, from uh, Colorado 66 to 56 to the north. That's going to complete that third lane section through that area. Right now we have a hundred plus million dollars identified for that segment. However, just this past week, we did hear from CEDA higher ups that they're going to commit to, to uh, fund that entire project, which is, a, is about a $320 million project. So look forward to that. How they're going to do that, we don't quite know yet, but uh, uh, they have committed to it. So uh, we're looking forward to getting that. And then the other one is our rural pavings. We do have three interstates within region four, I-76 and I-70 being two of the three. The other one would be, uh, what is our other one there? I-70, 76, and what's the other one? Yeah, but anyways, the two interstates there, we're gonna, it's very important, especially for those Eastern communities that we uh, put money into our preservations for our interstate and our rural roads. And this is the commitment for that, for that $57 million. That's kind of the highlights. This is again, like Jessica said, this is no longer draft, but this has been adopted. And if you do have any questions specifically for any of these projects, especially as related to what's in Dr. Cog, I would encourage you to reach out to Josie Hadley who's our senior planner, and uh, she can answer any questions that you might have about her plan. I almost lost her to, she, she was so burnt out over the plan development that she almost left CDOT, because she was the only planner that we had. <laughs> CDOT Region 1 and Region 4, thank you very much. So I wanna come back to the motion. This is the requested motion. Um, so this concludes our presentation. We'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Jacob, uh, would anyone like to make a motion? Ebra. My mic on? Yep. I'll move to recommend to the Regional Transportation Committee the draft 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan and associated Dr. Cog PM10 conformity determination, Denver Southern sub area eight hour ozone conformity de determination, and greenhouse gas transportation report. Oh, okay. We have a motion and a second. Is there anyone who'd like to discuss the motion? Oh, go ahead. Oh, we were just talking from the Boulder County. 
is and is just to acknowledge the amount, amazing amount of work that you Dr. Cog and CDOT. So we just pass that along as well. That we really appreciate what you've done and and how quickly you've done it. And so much for taking our comments. Thank you. Uh, well, Phil, I wanted to say the same thing, and uh, Jacob and staff, I wanted to, to note that you, somehow you were looking ahead when you were putting the 2050 MetroVision plan together three years ago when you started talking about urban centers and the whole dynamic of how the, the region uh, needs to be fully integrated, uh, land use and and transportation. I know the land use component uh, is, is what drives a lot of this. And I think uh, the way you guys handled that from several years ago has been very, very helpful to this. I don't see any other hands up for, um, for discussion. So why don't we vote on the motion? All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, please signify by saying no. Motion carries. Um, thank you very much. Our next item, number five on your agenda, is the uh, fiscal year 2022-5 Transportation Improvement Program Subregional Share, call number two, Forum Recommendations. Todd Cottrell. Oh boy, you guys ready for a lot of tip items? Um, no, so I just wanted to take a second and explain all four. Um, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. I don't recall having four items for action items. So I just want to make sure and explain this so we're all on the same page. Um, so this first item I'm going to cover, um, again, call two recommendations. This is very similar to the action or recommendation that you would have taken earlier this year or as a result of the call one projects, um, this recommendation will be to include them within the, the current tip. However, including them doesn't actually place them in the tip. So the next item, the next action item that Josh will go through is what we're calling special policy amendments. And this will place both call two projects in addition to call one projects that you took action on previously back in May um, to actually place them into the current 22 to 25 tip. Uh, the third item, um, back to me, will be outcomes for a call for projects for those communities that lie outside of the MPO boundary um, using only the Multimodal Options Fund program. Um, and then finally, back to Josh, who will review with you the regular policy amendments that we have typically on a quarterly basis for the TIP. With that, let's dive right into this item. Um, so, Total anticipated Dr. Cog um, funding that is available, again, just a recap so that we're all on the same page, approximately $450 million. Um, again, does not include the matching funds that communities will put forward. Um, this is broken down into four calls for projects. Um, the first two to program the current 22 to 25 tip. Um, we completed the action for the regional call again back in May. Um, highlighted, you will see this is the action for the sub-regional call. Um, call number two. We're moving right into calls three and four to program a brand new tip covering uh, fiscal years 24 to 27. Um, as you can see, this will use all of the funding that is available, so air quality multi -pro multimodal projects in addition to those projects eligible under the surface transportation block grant funding. So this table outlines sort of the results of call two. Um, this call took place from May 2nd to uh, June 24th, and again, for air quality and multimodal uh, projects only. Again, those projects must improve air quality and or congestion. Um, there was a target that was provided to each one of the, um, the forums. Um, those applications were submitted to those individual forums, and then either a technical committee or the forum itself would go through to score deliberate, and then recommend projects within that funding target. 
So as a summary, uh, 59 projects were submitted among the eight subregions for $186.2 million. Um, there was a funding target of $173 million, as I noted earlier. Um, as a result of the forum action, there was 50 projects that were recommended um, for $166.2 million. Uh, so you will know that $166 million in terms of the recommended funding is less than the target that was provided. Um, so as a result, that will mean that $6.8 million will sort of roll over into the total amount that is available within the current call three that we're in right now and call four. Um, a new total was then, um, was then made and then 20% of that new total did go to call three, 80% did go to call four. You will also see the asterisk there under Arapahoe County for their uh, recommended funding. Um, their recommendation was higher than their funding target, so I did want to explain that um, here in this next slide. So again, just a little bit more detail. So ultimately, the recommendations for the Arapahoe County Forum were um, their recommendations exceeded their funding target by 992,000. Um, within the Adams Forum, um, their submitted projects and their recommendations were under their target by approximately $6.4 million. So some additional a background concerning the projects that the town of Bennett submitted. They submitted three total applications. Um, two applications were within the Adams County Forum, one within the Arapahoe County Forum. Um, these three projects together essentially formed one longer trail system that ran from Bennett all the way south of um, I-70. Within the Arapahoe Forum, that happened to be their lowest scoring project. And the forum was only able to recommend $394,000 of the $1.3 million project. At that time, um, based on some Dr. Cog conversations, both Adams um, and the Arapahoe Forum, some technical members had discussions with the town of Bennett, um, ultimately leading to this recommendation. that uh, The Arapahoe Forum would recommend allocating $992,000 of the remaining amount that was available from the under allocation of the Adams Forum um, to fund the remaining balance of the Bennett application that was submitted within the Arapahoe Forum. Ultimately, not to make this more confusing, but what that ended um, as a result, let's say of the one point approximately $4 million request that came from and submitted to the Arapahoe Forum, $394,000 would be funded from the Arapahoe target and 992,000 would be funded with the, uh, with the Adams remaining target that was available. So as a result, very similar to what we did for call one, um, there was a continuation of a new process that we undertook um, earlier this year to seek public comments before um, the recommendations were made by the forum. Um, so the public comment process for call two uh, was open from July 1st to July 20th. Um, the public was able to comment directly on a web map or through either email or the phone. Um, they were notified through an e-blast and website and social media postings. Through that web map, they were actually able to indicate whether they uh, supported the project, had concerns, or were opposed to the individual project that was submitted. They were also able to add written comments um, to, to the individual project. In total, 165 comments were received, um, and then forums were able to use those comments within their deliberations uh, and their recommendation process. So before we get into the motion and the next steps, just wanted to take a step back and take a look at sort of what are the high level results of both call one and call two. Again, these are the projects that if approved by the board on Wednesday, will be going into the current tip where you'll be able to start your IGAs right, right away if you are one of those project sponsors. 50, 56 total projects were awarded across eight counties. Uh, this will look and be over 36 intersections that can provide um, improved operations for vehicles and transit. Um, 60 miles of bike ped facilities, 13 studies will help us prepare for what is coming up into the future. Almost three quarters of those projects will implement complete streets, 
and 82% uh, will improve connections to transit. Um, if we look at where those projects are located, uh, 29 unique um, sponsors across the region. Um, almost three quarters of those projects are either um, in or near an urban center or on the high injury network that Dr. Cog has. Um, projections indicate through the applications um, that it would result in 21 fewer, uh, fewer fatal crashes and 135 fewer serious injuries over the next five years. Um, if we look at the actual population in terms of where those projects are located, approximately one third of the population would be affected. Uh, and finally, the motion and the next steps. I think I'll hit the next steps here first. Um, so we are looking for your recommendation this, e this afternoon. Tomorrow morning, this will go to the, um, to the RTC and of course onto the board um, for Wednesday night. Um, there are other, act, other agenda items, as I noted previously, that are included in this packet to place those call one and call two projects into the TIP. So if that is successful um, throughout this process, um, later this week, um, you'll be seeing an email from Josh to send out award notifications. Um, at that time, feel free to reach out with CDOT. In fact, we would highly encourage reaching out to CDOT as soon as possible to begin those IGA notifications or IGA um, process. Uh, it will take a little bit of time for CDOT to put those projects into the SIP. But again, please reach out as soon as possible to begin that process. As hopefully, or most of you know, we do have call three that is open and that is open until October 11th. Um, shortly following by call four, another sub-regional process uh, which will open uh, right after Thanksgiving. So happy to take any comments or questions. Um, there are a link to the um, public comments and the actual projects by each forum that is listed in your packet. Otherwise, the motion before you would be to move to recommend to the Regional Transportation Committee the sub-regional share projects to be included in the current uh, 22 to 25 tip. I have a motion on the screen there. If anyone would like to make a motion or questions for Todd, we can also. I will second that motion. We have a motion. We have a second. Is there a discussion about the motion? Uh, let's go ahead and vote on the motion. Uh, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those who are opposed, please signify by saying no. Carries. Thank you, Todd. Thank you. And uh, as Todd described, our next item, uh, fast on the heels, is number six on your agenda. Uh, tw fiscal year 2022, 2020 through 2025, transportation improvement program special policy amendments calls for projects number one and two. Um, Josh, you think you've got this one? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Let me bring this up a little bit. Okay. Um, so yes, as Todd outlined, now that we've uh, approved the call to uh, project awards, we do need to amend the TIP to add um, both the set of call two sub-regional share projects and call one regional share projects into the TIP. Um, so included in your packet is a table of all of those projects. Uh, just a point of clarification on these. So uh, the table begins with the regional share projects followed by all of the sub-regional share projects in alphabetical order by sub-region. Um, some of these projects did receive uh, both regional and sub-regional funds, so that will only be shown once. Additionally, some projects received funds through multiple sub-regions, so again, those have been combined into a single project. Um, the majority of these are going to be new projects being added to the TIP, but in a couple cases, uh, it is being uh, included as additional scope and additional funding on existing projects, in which case you can see the TIP ID for those projects in parentheses uh, within the title column on the table. Um, so because of some of those combinations, there are 50 total unique uh, project changes shown uh, in this table. 
and that accounts for $206,549,000 in uh, new Dr. Cog funding being awarded. Um, so I do have a proposed motion available here for you in your packet um, and on the screen, but also happy to take any questions that members may have. Josh, are there any questions uh, for Josh? Or we have, can also entertain a motion. Go ahead, Justin. Thank you. I move to uh, recommend to the Regional Transportation Committee the attached project amendments from the TIP regional and sub regional call for projects, calls one and two, to the fiscal year 2022 2025 transportation improvement program. All right, any discussion on the motion? Run. I'm not specific to the motion, but I would take this opportunity to thank all of you, the sub-regional forums, um, the, this TIP process under the dual model is extremely complex and time consuming. It takes a lot of work. We could not get through this process if not for all of your work with us, but I would like specifically to call out Todd and Josh for their work with you through this process. Um, not only is the dual model process complicated, um, but this tip cycle is even more complicated because we're not just doing one regional call and one sub-regional call. We're actually doing two regional calls and two sub-regional calls. So now that we've completed, when we complete this step, we get to do it all over again. Uh, but I, I do really want to express our um, thanks and appreciation to all of you uh, working process. It, it's been a, it's been a, a big lift. Uh, we're really excited about the allocation of well over $200 million to really important projects um, to this region and in your communities um, through these first two calls and um, ready to move on to the next. Question? Uh, go ahead and vote then. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, please signify by saying no. Carries. Thank you. Gosh, uh, next we will move on to item number seven on your agenda. Uh, outcome of the Dr. Cog non-MPO multimodal transportation options funds call for projects. Todd Cottrell. All right, so try not to get everyone confused. Um, so if you recall four years ago, um, uh, First, as part of the 20 to 23 tip cycle, um, Dr. Cog did receive a, state, a new state funding source called Multimodal Options Fund, or MMOF. Um, so during this funding cycle, um, Dr. Cog received this funding for the entire Dr. Cog area, not just the MPO area. Um, at that time, we held a special call for projects um, for those communities that were outside of the MPO boundary therefore called the non-MPO portions of Dr. Cog. This includes Clear Creek and Gilpin counties, um, and the eastern portions of Adams and Arapahoe counties east of Kiowa Creek. So those are considered the non-MPO portions. Um, last year, there was a renewal of the state multimodal options fund. So Dr. Cog was able to do this again, essentially. Um, that renewal essentially um, allocated the funding program out for the next decade. Um, and we took a look at the funding that was available within this 23 to 27 timeframe, which matched up how we were doing these calls for projects one through four. So at that time, we also conducted a call for projects using the state multimodal funds only for those non-MPO sections of Dr. Cog. Um, using the allocation of approximately 1% of the funding available, um, which is the approximate percentage of uh, population employment in VMT as compared to the region. This $1.588 million, um, we did conduct a call for projects with it at the same time as we conducted this call to projects. So this was from um, May, early May out to June 24th. There was one application that was received, and that was from the town of Deer Trail, requesting $500,000 for a side path along US 40 from Pine Street to Burton Avenue. At the same time that we conducted the public comment period for call two, there was also a public comment period open for this call for projects. Uh, we, did not, 
we did not receive any comments um, for this project. Um, and so based on the application that was submitted and the call for projects that was conducted, uh, we are rec staff is recommending to fund this request. Um, so again, happy to take any comments or questions you may have. Um, otherwise, the motion before you would be to move to recommend to the Regional Transportation Committee uh, the project selected for funding from the non-MPO call for projects. Todd, uh, we have a recommended motion, uh, and uh, we can also open up to questions for Todd, if you like. Bill? But I just have a quick question. Is Open and Clear Creek County seem to have a lot of or any reason given why they submit for the dollars that are remaining? I am not 100% sure. Uh, we did not necessarily fee receive any direct feedback. Um, I think part of the reason is that they feel that this was a rather low amount to seek requests or to, to fund their projects they have that are considered necessary um, from these funds. So. They might have just done that with local funds. Go ahead, Phil. I recommend the regional transit uh, project selected for funding from the non NPO multimodal options fund projects. Oh. Second. Second. Uh, any discussion on the motion? All right, we'll vote. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, please signify by saying no. Oh, I said no. <laughs> <laughs> we'll withdraw I that. Meant, I already that. said aye. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, the motion carries. Thank you. <laughs> I don't think that's ever happened before. <laughs> Everybody laughed. All right, next item on our agenda, item number eight, uh, trans uh, fiscal year to to 2022 through 2025, Transportation Improvement Program Policy Amendments. Uh, Josh, you're up again. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, last tip item on the agenda. So you uh, previously voted on the special policy amendments. This is going to be the regular policy amendments that you would see in an ordinary month. So we do have five proposed amendments. Um, the first would be to add $8.5 million in state safety funding to the Region 1 hazard elimination pool. That's actually uh, related to the second one, which would be to remove one pool project from the Region 1 faster pool. This is for the uh, Denver West runaway truck ramp, which is actually moving over to the Region 1 hazard elimination pool um, and is accounted for in that additional funding on that pool. Uh, next, we have the addition of $32,817,000 in state legislative funding on the State Highway 119 corridor safety and mobility operational improvements. Um, this is for some additional uh, CDOT Region 4 scope on that project. Um, and then the final two projects are switching state multimodal options funds uh, with the federal multimodal options funds uh, using federal ARPA funding. So that is changing $2.4 million on the State Highway 7 and 95th Street project and all $5 million on the State Highway 119 and 63rd Street projects from state to federal funding. Um, so happy to take any questions on those five proposed projects or I do have a proposed motion available for you here in your packet. Josh, are there any uh, questions for Josh? Or if you'd like to make a motion, you're welcome to do that as well. Frank. Yes, I'd like to move to recommend to the Regional Transportation Committee the attached amendments to the fiscal year 2022-2025 Re Transportation Improvement Program. Frank. Oh, oh. oh okay. sorry. I'll second. All right, we've got a second. Uh, any discussion on the motion? Okay, all those uh, voting in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, please signify by saying no. Motion carries. Gosh. All right, that is all of our action items for today. Uh, moving on to the agenda to the administrative items. Uh, do we have an AMP working group? In the corner over here. 
Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. Just a short one here. Uh, earlier this month, the AMP Working Group met. Uh, we had a call for vice chair, looking for a vice chair for the group, and we'll see how that goes along in the coming months. The group also heard some informational briefings, uh, one from the Colorado Energy Office regarding their EV equity study and tools platform. They also discussed, um, as a group, the USDOT smart grant funding and potential opportunities for partner coordination. That's all. Carson. Anyone else who has a member comment or other matters to bring up today? None. Uh, we'll move on. Our next meeting uh, is actually not going to be October 24th. We decided to uh, make game day decision to cancel that meeting. Uh, that's only going to be two weeks before our next meeting on uh, November 14th uh, due to the, um, to the Thanksgiving holiday. So our next meeting will actually be November 14th. So make sure to make that change on your calendar. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, we are adjourned. I look forward to seeing you in November. That would be very, very filled.